This is Volume 1, Part 2 of the New and Complete Newgate Calendar, read by Roy Schreiber. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Circumstantial Account of the Life, Trial, Piracies, and Execution of Captain John Kidd, who is hanged at Execution Dock. The case of Captain Kidd, while in agitation, engaged the attention of the public in a very eminent degree, though the man himself was one of the most contemptible of the human race. The town of Greenock in Scotland gave birth to Captain Kidd, who was bred to the sea, and having quitted his native country, he resided at New York, where he became the owner of a small vessel, with which he traded among the pirates, obtained a thorough knowledge of their haunts, and could give a better account of them than any other person whatever. He was neither remarkable for the excels of his courage, nor for the want of it. In a word, his ruling passion appeared to be avarice, and to this was owing his connection with the pirates. When Kidd was in company with these abandoned people, he used to converse and act as they did. Yet at other times he would make singular professions of honesty, and intimate how easy a matter it would be to extirpate these people and prevent their making future depredations. His frequent remarks of this kind engaged the notice of several considerable planters, who formed a more favorable idea of him than his true character would warrant, and procured him the patronage with which he was afterwards honored. Before we enter into further particulars respecting this man, it would be proper to say something of the situation of public affairs previous to and at the time he began to grow conspicuous. For years past great complaints had been made of the piracies committed in the West Indies, which had been greatly encouraged by some of the inhabitants of North America, on account of the advantage that could be made by the purchase of effects thus fraudulently obtained. This coming to the knowledge of King William the Third, he, in the year 1695, bestowed the government of New England and New York on the Earl of Bellamont, an Irish nobleman of distinguished character and abilities. As soon as His Majesty had conferred this honor on Lord Bellamont, his lordship began to consider of the most effectual method to redress the evils complained of, and he represented to Colonel Levingston, a gentleman who had great property in New York, that some proper step should be taken to obviate the evils so long complained of. Just at this juncture Captain Kidd was arrived from New York in a sloop of his own. Him, therefore, the Colonel mentioned to Lord Bellamont as a bold and daring man, who was very fit to be employed against the pirates, as he was perfectly well acquainted with the places which they resorted at. This plan met with the fullest approbation of his lordship, who, knowing how desirous the king was that this nest of pirates should be destroyed, mentioned the affair to his majesty, who greatly applauded the design, and recommended it to the notice of the board of admiralty. The commissioners likewise approved it, but such were then the hurry and confusion of public affairs that, though the design was approved, no steps were taken towards carrying it into execution. The transactions on this head being imparted to Colonel Levingston, he made an application to Lord Bellamont, and informed him that, as the affair would not will well admit of delay, it was worthy of being undertaken by some private persons of rank and distinction, and carried into execution at their own expense, notwithstanding public encouragement was denied it. Lord Bellamont approved of this project but it was attended with considerable difficulty. At length, however, the Lord Chancellor Somers, the Duke of Shrewsbury, the Earl of Romney, the Earl of Oxford, and some other persons, with Colonel Levingston and Captain Kidd, agreed to raise six thousand pounds for the expense of the voyage, and the Colonel and the Captain were to have a fifth of the profits of the whole undertaking. This plan was so highly approved of by King William, who thought it would produce such great advantages to his subjects, that he promised to contribute to its success, 
and therefore a reserve was agreed to be made of a tenth part of the effects seized from the pirates for the use of his majesty but after the contract was concluded the king could not spare his share of the money and therefore the whole was advanced by the above-mentioned persons matters being thus far adjusted a commission in the usual form was granted to captain kidd to take and seize pirates and bring them to justice but there was no special clause or proviso to restrain his conduct or to regulate the mode of his proceeding kidd was known to lord bellamont and another gentleman presented him to lord romney with regard to the other parties concerned he was wholly unacquainted with them and so ill was this affair conducted that he had no private instruction how to act but received his sailing orders from lord bellamont the purport of which was that he should act agreeable to the letter of his commission accordingly a vessel was purchased and manned and received the name of the adventure galley and in this captain kidd sailed from new york toward the close of the year sixteen ninety five and in his passage made a prize of a french ship from new york he sailed to the madeira islands thence to buena Vista and st iago and from this last place to madagascar he now began to cruise at the entrance of the red sea but not being successful in those latitudes he sailed to calicut and there took a ship of one hundred and fifty tons burden which he carried to madagascar and was disposed of there having sold his prize he again put to sea and at the expiration of five weeks took the quaita merchant a ship of above four hundred tons burden the master of which was an englishman named wright who had two dutch mates on board and a french gunner but the crew consisted of moors natives of africa and were about ninety in number he carried the ship to st mary's near madagascar where he burnt the adventure galley belonging to his owners and divided the lading of the quaita merchant with his crew taking forty shares to himself they then went on board the last mentioned ship and sailed for the west indies it is uncertain whether the inhabitants of the west indian islands knew that kidd was a pirate but he was refused refreshments at anguilla and st thomas's and therefore sailed to mona between puerto rico and hispaniola where through the management of an englishman named bolton he obtained a supply of provisions from curacao he now bought a sloop of bolton in which he stowed greater part of his ill-gotten effects and left the quaita merchant with eighteen of the ship's company in bolton's care while at st mary's ninety men of kidd's crew left him and went on board the mooka merchant an east india ship which had just then commenced pirate kidd now sailed the sloop and touched at several places where he disposed of a great part of his cargo and then steered for boston in new england in the interim bolton sold the quaita merchant to the spaniards and immediately sailed as a passenger in a ship to boston where he arrived a considerable time before kidd and gave information of what happened to lord bellamont then the resident governor kidd therefore on his arrival was seized by order of his lordship when all he had to urge in his defence was that he thought that the quaita merchant was a lawful prize as she was manned with moors though there was no kind of proof that this vessel had committed any act of piracy upon this the earl of bellamont immediately dispatched an account to england of the circumstances that had arisen and requested that a ship might be sent for kidd who had committed several other notorious acts of piracy the ship rochester was accordingly sent to bring him to england but this vessel happening to be disabled was obliged to return a circumstance which greatly increased a public clamour which had for some time subsisted respecting this affair it is not to be doubted but that this clamour took its rise from party prejudice yet it was carried to such a height 
that the members of Parliament for several places were instructed to move the House for an inquiry into the affair, and, accordingly, it was moved in the House of Commons that, quote, the letters patent granted to the Earl of Bellamont and others, respecting the goods taken from pirates, were dishonourable to the King against the law of nations, contrary to the laws and statutes of this realm, an invasion of property, and destructive to commerce. End quote. Though a negative was put on this motion, yet the enemies of Lord Somers and the Earl of Oxford continued to charge those noblemen with giving countenance to pirates, and it was even insinuated that the Earl of Bellamont was no less culpable than the actual offenders. Another motion was accordingly made in the House of Commons to address His Majesty that, quote, Kidd might not be tried till the next session of Parliament, and that the Earl of Bellamont might be directed to send home all examinations and other papers relative to this affair. End quote. This motion was carried, and the King complied with the request which was made. As soon as Kidd arrived in England, he was sent for and examined at the bar of the House of Commons, with a view to fix part of his guilt on the parties who had been concerned in sending him on the expedition. But nothing arose to criminate any of those distinguished persons. Kidd, who was in some degree intoxicated, made a very contemptible appearance at the bar of the house, on which a member, who had been one of the most earnest to have him examined, violently exclaimed, "'Damn this fellow! I thought he had been only a knave, but unfortunately he happens to be a fool likewise.' Kidd was at length tried at the Old Bailey, and was convicted on the clearest evidence, but neither at that time nor afterwards charged any of his employers with being privy to his infamous proceedings. He was hanged at Execution Dock on the twenty-third day of May, 1701, but a circumstance happened at his execution that will be worthy of recital. After he had been tied up to the gallows, the rope broke, and he fell to the ground but being immediately tied up again, the ordinary, who had before exhorted him, desired to speak with him once more, and on his second application entreated him to make the most careful use of the few farther moments thus providentially allotted him for the final preparation of a soul to meet its important change. These exhortations appeared to have the wished-for effect and he was left professing his charity to all the world and his hopes of salvation through the merits of his redeemer in this manner ended the life of captain kidd a man who if he had entertained a proper regard to the welfare of the public or even to his own advantage might have become a useful member of society instead of a disgrace to it the opportunities he had obtained of inquiring a complete knowledge of the haunts of the pirates, rendered him one of the most proper men in the world to have extirpated this nest of villains, but his own avarice defeated the generous views of some of the greatest and most distinguished men of the age in which he lived. Hence we may learn the destructive nature of avarice, which generally counteracts all of its own purposes. Captain Kidd might have acquired a fortune, and rendered material service to his country in point of the most essential interest. But he appeared to be dead to all those generous sensations which do honor to humanity, and materially injured his country while he was bringing final disgrace on himself. The history of this wretched malefactor will effectually impress on the mind of the reader the truth of the old observation that, quote, honesty is the best policy, unquote. Henceforth, let honor's path be trod, nor villains seek in vain, to mock the sacred laws of God, and give their neighbors pain. Account of the Parentage, Life, Execution, and etc. of Herman Stodman, who suffered at Tyburn for the murder of Peter Walter. Henry Stodman, who came of a good family, was born in Ravel in Leesland about the year 1683. His parents, who were of 
a religious disposition gave him a liberal and pious education he was sent by his father to school at lubeck in the year sixteen ninety four where he remained till michaelmas sixteen ninety eight at this period he went to hamburg where he continued some months and then in company with a young countryman of his named peter walter embarked for england and on their arrival in london they were both bound apprentices to messrs stein and dorian merchants and partners both these young gentlemen lived together in great harmony for a considerable time but in the month of august preceding the fatal tragedy of which we were about to recite the particulars mr dorian was married to the sister of peter walter hereupon the latter began to assume airs of consequence and behaved with so much insolence to stodman that his pride took the alarm they had several quarrels and walter beat stodman twice at one time in the counting-house and at another before the serving-girls in the kitchen walter likewise traduced stodman to his masters who thereupon denied him the liberty and other gratifications that were allowed his fellow prentice hereupon stodman conceived an implacable hatred against him and resolved to murder him in some way or other his first intention was to have poisoned him and with this view he mixed some white mercury with the white powder which walter used to keep in a glass in his bedroom as a remedy for the scurvy but this happening to be done in the midst of winter walter had declined taking the powder so that the other thought of destroying him by the more expeditious method of stabbing this scheme however was delayed from time to time while walter's pride and arrogance increased to such a degree that the other thought he should at length be tempted to murder him in sight of the family hereupon stodman desired one of the maids to intimate to his masters his inclination to be sent to the west indies but no answer being given to his request stodman grew so uneasy and his enmity against his fellow prentice increased to such a degree that the dutch maid observing the agitation of his mind advised him to a patient submission to this situation as the most probable method of securing his future peace unfortunately he paid no regard to this good advice but determined on the execution of the fatal plan which afterwards led to his destruction on the morning of good friday stodman was sent out on business but instead of transacting it he went to greenwich with an intention of returning on saturday to perpetuate the murder but reflecting that his fellow apprentice was to receive the sacrament on easter sunday he abhorred the thought of taking away his life before he had partaken of the lord's supper wherefore he sent a letter to his masters on the saturday in which he asserted that he had been impressed and was to be sent to chatham on easter monday and put on board a ship in the royal navy but while he was at greenwich he was met by a young gentleman who knew him and who returning to london told messrs stein and dorian he believed the story of his being impressed was all invention hereupon mr stein went to chatham to inquire into the real state of the case when he discovered that the young gentleman's suspicions were all too well founded stodman went to the church at greenwich twice on easter sunday and on the approach of evening came to london and slept at the dolphin inn in bishopsgate street on the following day he returned to greenwich and continued either at that place or at woolwich and at the neighbourhood till tuesday when he went to london lodged in lombard street and returned to greenwich on wednesday coming again to london on the evening of the succeeding day he did not return any more to greenwich but going to the house of his master he told them that what he had written was true for he had been pressed they gave no credit to this tale but told him they had inquired into the affair and bid him quit their house this he did and took lodging in moorfields where he lay on that and the following night and on the saturday he took other lodgings at the sun in queen street london 
Before the preceding Christmas he had procured a key on the model of that belonging to his master's house, that he might go in and out at pleasure. Originally he intended to have made no worse use of this key, but it being still in his possession, he let himself into the house between eight and nine o'clock on the evening of the Saturday last mentioned. But hearing footsteps of some persons going upstairs, he concealed himself behind the door in the passage. As soon as the noise arising from the circumstance was over, he went up a pair of stairs to the room adjoining the counting-house, where he used to sleep, and having found a tinder-box, he lighted a candle and put it into his master's dark lantern-horn, which he carried upstairs to an empty room next to that in which Peter Walter used to lay. Here he continued a short time, when hearing somebody coming upstairs, he put out his candle and fell asleep soon afterwards. Awaking about twelve o'clock, he listened for a while, and hearing no noise, he imagined that the whole family were fast asleep. Hereupon he descended to the room on the first floor where the tinder-box lay, and having lighted his candle, he went to the counting-house and took a sum of money and several bills and notes. This being done, he took a piece of wood with which he used to beat tobacco, and going upstairs again, he hastily entered the room where Peter Walter was asleep, and advancing to his bedside struck him violently on the head, and though his heart in some degree failed him, yet he continued his strokes. As the wounded youth groaned much, he took a pillow and lay it on his mouth, sat down on the side of the bed, and pressed it hard with his elbows, till no appearance of life remained. Perceiving Walter to be quite dead, he searched his chest of drawers and pockets, and took as much money as what he had taken from his master's amounted to above eight pounds. He then packed up some linen and woollen clothes, and going down one pair of stairs, he threw his bundle into a house that was uninhabited. He then went upstairs again, and having cut his candle, lighted both pieces, one of which he placed in a chair close to the bed-curtains, and the other on a chest of drawers with a view to have set the house on fire to conceal the robbery and murder of which he had been guilty. This being done, he went through a window into the house where he had thrown his bundle, and in this place he stayed till five in the morning, when he took the bundle with him to his lodgings in Queen Street, where he shifted his apparel and went to the Swedish church in Trinity Lane. After the worship of the congregation had ended, he heard a bill of thanks read which his masters had sent, in devout acknowledgment of their narrow escape themselves and their neighbors had experienced from the fire. Struck by this circumstance, Strodman burst into tears, but he endeavored as much as possible to conceal his emotions from a gentleman who sat in the same pew with him, and who, on their coming out of the church, informed him that the house of Messrs. Stein and Dorian narrowly escaped being burnt the preceding night by an accident then unknown but that the destruction was providentially prevented by the Dutch maid smelling the fire and seeing the smoke, so that on her alarming her master the flames were extinguished with a pail of water. Strodman made an appointment to meet the gentleman who gave him this information on the outer walks of the Royal Exchange in the afternoon, to go to the Dutch church in the Savoy. But the gentleman not coming to this time, he went alone to Stepney Church, and after service was ended he walked towards Mile End, where he saw the two Dutchmen, these must have been Michael Van Bergen and his servant Dromulus, who had been hung in chains. This sight gave him a shocking idea of the crime of which he had been guilty, and he reflected that he might soon become a like horrid spectacle to mankind. Hence he proceeded to Blackwall, where he saw the captain of a French pirate hanging in chains, which gave fresh force to the gloomy feelings of his mind, and again taught him to dread a similar fate. After having been thus providentially led to the sight of objects which he would otherwise rather have avoided, he returned to his lodgings in great dejection of mind. But far from repenting, or even being properly sensible of 
the crime he had committed, for, as he himself said, his heart did not yet repent for what he had done, and if he had failed murdering his fellow prentice in his bed, he should have destroyed him some other way. On his return to his lodgings he ate supper, said his prayers, and went to bed. On the following morning he went to the White Horse Inn without Cripplegate to receive cash for a bill of twenty pounds which he had stolen from his master's house. But the person who was to have paid it being gone out, he was desired to call again about twelve o'clock. In the interim he went to the house of a banker in Lombard Street, who requested him to carry some money for his, the banker's sister, who is at a boarding school in Greenwich. Stodman said he could not go till the following day, when he would execute the commission. But before he left the house of the banker, he told him that a young man named Green had been to inquire for him, on which Stodman said that if Mr. Green returned, he should be informed that he would come back again at one o'clock. Hence he went again to the White Horse Inn, where he found the party, who told him that he had no orders to pay the money for the bill. Having received this answer, he went to his lodgings where he dined, and then went to the banker's in Lombard Street, where his master, Stein, with Mr. Green and another gentleman, were waiting for him. Mr. Stein asked him if he would go willingly to his house, or be carried thither by porters, and he replied that he would go of his own accord. When he came there, he was asked some questions respecting the atrocious crimes which he had been guilty of. But, persisting that he was innocent, he was searched, and the twenty-pound bill found in his possession. They then inquired where he lodged, to which he answered, Moor Fields. Whereupon they all went thither together, but the people denied his lodging there at that time. Mr. Stein, finding him unwilling to speak the truth, told him that he, if he would make a full discovery, he would be sent abroad out of the reach of justice. Thereupon he mentioned his real lodgings, on which they went thither in a coach, and finding the bills and other stolen effects, Stodman was carried before Sir Humphrey Edwin, who committed him to Newgate on his own confession. He was not tried at the first sessions after his commitment, and in the interval that he lay in prison some bad people who were confined there trumped up an idle tale for him to tell when he came to trial, and prevailed on him to plead not guilty, a circumstance which he afterwards sincerely repented of. On his trial, however, there were so many corroborative proofs of his guilt that the jury could not hesitate to convict him, and he received the sentence awarded by law. While he was under sentence of death, his behavior was remarkably contrite and penitent, and when the ordinary of Newgate told him that the warrant of his execution was come down, and that he would suffer in a few days, he said, quote, The Lord's will be done. I am willing to die, only I beg of God that I may not, as I deserve, die an eternal death, and that though I die here for my most heinous and enormous crimes, yet I may, for the love of Christ, live eternally with him in heaven. God bless the King and all my honourable judges. They have done me no wrong, but tis I have done great wrong. The Lord be merciful to me, a great sinner, else I perish. End quote. At times he seemed to despair because he feared that his repentance was not equal to his guilt. But then again his mind was occasionally warmed with the hope that his penitence was such as would lead to salvation. When at the place of execution he acknowledged his crime, for which he professed the sincerest sorrow and repentance. He begged pardon of God for having endeavoured, with presumptuous lies, to conceal those crimes which, being punished in this world, his eternal punishment in the next might be avoided. He died full of contrition, penitence, and hope, and suffered at Tyburn on the 18th of June, 1701, and it was remarked that he kept his hands lifted up for a considerable time after the cart was drawn away. 
This is the end of Volume 1, Part 2 of the New and Complete Newgate Calendar.